Uh, let me say, first of all, again, uh, what a terrific opportunity and, and a privilege it is for me to be able to address uh, an audience uh, through New Mind Center. And I also want to commend you, Richard, on selecting the name Neuro at Night. That, that's so romantic. And, uh, <laughs> that's got quite an appeal to it. That's, uh, that's a good way to go. So um, uh, this is my uh, appreciation to my hosts, uh, both Richard Suter and Robert Longo, who I've enjoyed spending time with terribly much at, at several meetings in the past year or so. So if, if I can get my, uh, there we go. So uh, this is part two then of our workshop on management, integrative management of sensitized chronic pain using autonomic self-regulation clinical and research, and this is the research part of it. Uh, you'll recall, I hope, that autonomic self-regulation is a term I use to incorporate the three types of approaches that the coach or therapist would use. That's HRV biofeedback, also called resonance frequency breathing biofeedback, plus mindfulness, uh, heart, um, heart or breathing mindfulness, plus positive emotional state. And so together, I think it's better to refer to that as an aggregate of autonomic self-regulation um, to emphasize that it is integrated. They all go together and produce, I believe, the best outcomes. So tonight, I want to go on a little bit more about uh, some work we've done here in Columbia, South Carolina on collecting data with uh, patients <coughs> with uh, chronic disease, including pain in using the autonomic self-regulation uh, intervention. And again, about myself, um, I'm a licensed psychologist and neuropsychologist and uh, have some research uh, programs. I have an additional adjunct appointment at South Carolina School of Medicine in this department here, the PPN, and that's contact information for me. So um, <clears throat> once again, let me remind you uh, my disclaimer here that I'm I do not claim that I'm not really expert in cardiology or I'm not really highly trained in pain uh, or medication is outside my scope. I am a neuropsychologist. I'm particularly interested in cognitive psychophysiology based on both my clinical and my research background. Uh, there's no conflict of interest affiliations or product endorsement here. Um, these slides are either original, available on the internet, or I've given acknowledgement where I've gotten them. And uh, importantly here, these models are intended to be didactic and heuristic uh, for your learning purposes. And they, I believe, are correct as far as they go, but uh, they are incomplete and simplified. I'm not trying to uh, give a medical lecture on cardiovascular physiology or research proposal at that level. So there, there are some um, endpoints here where the talk does not go and there just is it's, um, not fully complete there. So, so uh, the overview of what I wanna do tonight <clears throat> is begin and add uh, for you the importance or emphasize the importance of pain and nutrition and using uh, these uh, topics here of autonomic control of enteric nervous system, which we'll call the ENS uh, with uh, sensitized chronic pain, and including neurogenic inflammation and the role that it plays, uh, including nutrition uh, and uh, its contributions to sensitized chronic pain. And then I give a couple of models of pain, which are again, just heuristic uh, there. They're just that, they're models in chronic pain. And then uh, describe some studies that we've done here and present some of the data. So um, starting then with this idea about nutrition, this is a, wanna begin, I wanna begin with a very interesting study I just ran across uh, <clears throat> where the results are, um, show, uh, and it's very carefully, thoroughly done a study in, in, the mag, in the journal Cell, uh, just I'm really it's hot off the press in the last week or two. Hunger attenuates inflammatory pain without influencing acute pain responses. Hunger sensitive agouti related protein, uh, abbreviated that, neurons project to the parabrachial nucleus and suppress inflammatory pain. This is what I was referring to before as sensitized pain. This is the stress component 
which amplifies and brings in the, um, the loss of the descending uh, modulation and uh, is uh, associated with high levels or the, the infl runaway inflammatory train. And so it's not directly related to tissue pain, to either uh, nociceptive uh, injury to tissue or neuropathic um, lesions to nerves. Neuropeptide Y signals in the PBN attenuates the inflammatory pain during hunger. So it is the hungry animal looks for food even when in pain. And it's pretty obvious there how you can see the adaptive significance of that. So in the model here that's presented in this article, uh, if you take an animal who is not hungry um, and subject him to an acute pain, uh, he also will show in time the sensitization of that and the alterations of the neuromodulator and the amplification of pain. But when hungry, uh, after an acute pain, the acute pain is uh, normal, uh, but he is uh, not subject to the inflammatory, longer-term sensitized pain aspect of it. And this is the model uh, in the uh, animal, uh, showing uh, schematically the uh, delivery of this protein to the PBN. This is not as useful as uh, trying to place it into a uh, human context where the PBN, which is here in the uh, ponds and the, uh, below the <coughs> cerebellum, is directly in the ascending spinal thalamic tract of pain from dorsal horn. And you can see there that this is like a, a modulator of the effects of external pain which normally produces the stress response, which becomes unbridled uh, in cases of chronic pain, uh, leading to overdrive of sympathetic uh, systems and um, the loss of the descending pain modulation and the runaway inflammation. But here, um, during states of hunger, because of the influx of this AGRP, uh, it the parabrachial nucleus, the uh, sensitization is attenuated. I think that's a very important um, aspect of this, that uh, even sensitized chronic pain transiently uh, can be modified uh, through um, altering the um, input to the stress response. So uh, let's dig in a little bit on enteric nervous system. It's also called the gut brain. Uh, interacts with the central autonomic nervous system, which we'll abbreviate as CANS. The enteric nervous system is subordinate to the CANS, which as you'll recall is largely responsible for cardiac regulation, the stress response, and inflammation. The ENS complements and has direct interactions with the central system. It is controlled by sympathovagal function. It's just another branch of the wandering vagus nerve uh, that reaches to uh, gastro and abdominal organs, regulates appetite with signaling through the brain stem, promotes calorie storage and fat gain, controls GI tract function. Uh, you can see how a normal or a balanced autonomic nervous system would, um, when it's working properly, would uh, enable and benefit um, GI and digestion. Uh, the vagus nerve potentiates glucose-stimulated insulin secretion from beta cells in the pancreas. So we need that PNS to maintain a balance of insulin and blood glucose, but when not functioning properly, leads to obesity, to diabetes, and neurogenic inflammation. So let's look a little closer at that. Here's a model here. Um, this is a model of acetate from gut microbiota stimulating vagal output, leading to the increase in glucose-stimulated insulin. When this gets to be out too far out of range, you have a lot of problems. Uh, it's a form, it's a, an example, it, a, a, a variety of type two diabetes, but, but let's look here. Uh, the mechanism of microbiota mediated weight gain in the mouse, uh, production by microbiota of acetate from dietary nutrients increases the vagal output. This is the, the normal rest and digest. So when you're digesting here, you are 
uh, sending acetate uh, is reaching the brain. This triggers secretion of ghrelin uh, from the stomach, which returns to the brain. This is regulating food intake here, GI movement and digestion. So everything is normal, everybody's happy here. The PNS nervous system is also involved in insulin control through blood glucose. And glucose, as we all know, is main stimulus for insulin. So we're having the blood glucose that is, the stomach is producing from, through digestion, uh, passing through the circulation, reaching the pancreas, producing insulin. Well, that's all good. Everybody's happy here, but when there occur, when resistance occurs to insulin or the caloric intake uh, becomes dysregulated for whatever reason, you now have a system that will continue to produce blood glucose and insulin and uh, caloric intake is lost leading to obesity. Well, this is important then for our purpose and, and because of its associations with pain. It's largely related to the total Western diet. And, and I think all of us here in, in whole health are, are quite uh, familiar with the evils, you might say, of the total Western diet. And maybe that's not the right word, but with the, the, um, the reasons that we should um, avoid a total Western diet as much as possible, which is built on fats, sugars, processed carbohydrates, additives, preservatives, you could add in there red meat, of course, um, because of its association with decreased microbiome diversity. This is the very thing we were just looking at there with acetate production, regulating um, blood glucose. Um, B1, that should be a one, B2, foliate, calcium, coenzyme Q2, Q10, and omega-3 fatty acids, all of which we need to have to have normal uh, digestion and metabolism. It also brings increased total calories, reliance on a liquid diet, too much caffeine and alcohol, uh, too much fat, pro-inflammation results, free radical oxidation, C-reactive protein and pro-inflammatory um, uh, agent uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes, uh, which is also um, exemplified by insulin resistance. Um, um, irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, pelvic pain, and increased pain sensitivity. So too much uh, total Western diet uh, is associated with increase in IBS, fibromyalgia, pain, pelvic pain, pain sensitivity. Well, typically too, uh, if we're not careful, if our uh, level of magnesium declines because of too much filtered or purified water, I think the, the rule of thumb here is, or the wisdom is to drink magnesium but not bathe in it. Uh, it is hard on, on skin and um, shampoos and so on, uh, but it's a good thing to have in your diet, so we don't want to eliminate magnesium. Uh, too little magnesium associated with C-reactive protein, inflammation, pain, and migraines. Uh, loss of glycemic control, this is elevation of blood glucose, is associated with arthritis and joint replacements. High blood sugar damages peripheral nerves, that's just what we call neuropathy. And type 2 diabetes from insulin resistance is associated with obesity. Obesity is associated with pro-inflammation, adipokines leading to increased pain, and to throw in there the neurogenic immune reaction uh, becomes activated with increased microglial sensitivity and central sensitization. Well, if I haven't convinced you already, I don't know what else I could do, that um, diet is a contributor and is uh, a particularly important factor in trying to manage pain. In this article here, uh, fairly recent as well, and I apologize that the, um, the graphic here is, is sort of fuzzy, but uh, it, here's the uh, article. Uh, you can go and look at the nice uh, graphic of it, but pain conditions associated with obesity include carpal tunnel connective tissue, fibromyalgia, GI disorders, gout, low back pain, migraine and headache, neuropathy, osteoarthritis, plantar I mean, I don't know if they're reaching too far or not, but that, that's what's on the list, um, and rotator cuff. Well, again, this is not news for a lot of whole health practitioners, but what is new or what is important about it is the awareness that is coming out 
uh, at all different levels now associated with whole health and we are in position then to carry this message forward uh, to even greater benefit of our patients as well as uh, increasing our own effect um, and in this graphic here again terribly uh, fuzzy uh, obesity related pain a framework and what he's saying here and, and what I've done as you can see uh, I've numbered these uh, it's very difficult to pull this information out but it's I've uh, rewritten it here for you so you can uh, put the two together but the idea is is that when there is an interaction a network or system interaction of uh, these inflammatory mediators which are all uh, metabolites and uh, uh, results of our, our nutritional status uh, interacting with comorbid conditions such as depression fatigue deconditioning and uh, further interacting with baseline characteristics including genetic and environmental factors then we see this uh, dramatic or noticeable um, increase in systemic inflammation. So I want to go back and slightly redo the graphic that I presented in part one, uh, which was an illustration of the uh, inner and outer circles of sensitization of pain where we have initially uh, tissue injury that uh, does produce neurogenic inflammation through the stress response leading to peripheral sensitization through spinal and then an overall amplification which then spins off into this secondary socio-economic or socio uh, biopsychosocial um, environment here and uh, really emphasize the neurogenic. What is going to have to happen is uh, there's going to have to be a new box fit in here somewhere. And this is a wonderful slide that uh, Dr. Gallagher presented at a meeting a couple of years ago. Um, but somehow ENS has to go on here. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure yet where. We could take a little poll, but maybe right in here somewhere or something like that. But ENS has to be put in here, the enteric nervous system and its contribution. Uh, is is helping to drive this if uh, your diet is not well controlled. So let's follow this arrow here then, the neurogenic inflammation, and see what it tells us. Activation of neurogenic immune response and inflammation by poor diet and chronic pain. The CNS was previously thought to lack a lymphatic system but the CNS has immune surveillance in the meninges and this is the new finding this is what's very exciting and important about this uh, and uh, these um, uh, surveillance or, or these cells govern CNS entrance and exit of T cells in and out of the meninges and lymphatic vessels do line dural sinuses so this is uh, an update of conventional medical um, text. Uh, Hyperexcitability caused by alterations of pain signaling in the brain rising up through spinal produce immune response and peripheral inflammation. So we can now add not just inflammation from stress but an immune response uh, to particular sorts of, of excitability or activations coming into the nervous system. And this is a small reading list on that for anyone who wants to go further. Now, uh, tonight's talk is, is going to be relatively short uh, for y'all who are, are used to hearing me kind of run it right up to the uh, limit here. So um, we're, we're moving along pretty well, I think. It's not even 7.30 yet. So let's look at a couple of models of uh, pain, starting with Lorimer Mosley, an Australian pain researcher, and his model, uh, very interesting. Uh, the assumption is here that pain is a multiple system output activated by an individual's specific pain neural signature. And so what that does is create, you know, a subjectivity to it, which we all know is intractable to any type of pain uh, description. Pain is multisensory and emotional. It's felt in the body, results in the need to take action to protect that body part and governed by and, and just anatomically the A delta fibers, which are fast, myelinated, slowly adapting, uh, C fibers, which are small, thin, unmyelated, uh, relatively slow, and upregulated in the presence of inflammation and cause inflammation. 
What's important and different and interesting in his model, nociception responds to changes generally in the environment, not only to tissue status. And so here you begin to see what psychologists, we call psychological factors, pain condition with psychological factors. So these changes in the environment here do include perceptions. The neural signature is activated whenever the brain perceives a threat. And he chooses to call it danger. Uh, there are probably other things that you could talk about, but what he's saying is that environmental stimulation will produce a pain signaling response. So the nociceptors are not just pain receptors, but more generally danger receptors. So uh, his model here um, has led to uh, what you can find in, in uh, out there is the fear avoidance model. And this should be pain, not paid adaptation. So he tells this story about himself as illustration. He was hiking in the Australian outback with friends when he felt something scratch his left ankle. It was painful enough to make him pull his leg away but he just kept walking, figuring he'd scraped his ankle on a stick. He woke up two days later in a hospital where doctors told him he'd been bitten by the deadly poisonous eastern brown snake and was lucky to be alive. Well, that's not the end of the story. Being resilient, he was out hiking again six months later when he was stopped dead in his tracks by a searing pain in his left ankle. He fell to the ground and screamed for help. His friends called an ambulance, but when they examined him, they found a twig stuck in his sock. Yet his ankle continued to hurt. He had groin pain for a week, just as he had after the snake bite, and he could not talk himself out of it. But I think the point there is self-evident, which is that perceptions of danger, of environmental threat, produce uh, a pain reaction or a stress reaction that also includes pain signaling. This is a pretty extreme example of it, but uh, that's the idea. And I think in the clinic, it's not too difficult to find individuals who probably are experiencing something like uh, perceptions of environmental stimulation leading to uh, the experience or perception of pain signaling. So in the fear avoidance models, uh, there's initially some type of injury, whether or not it could be precipitated by uh, pure perception is unclear. But um, if there's a pain experience, you sort of have this um, bifurcation here where it can lead to catastrophizing negative affectivity, adding to this. Now you have pain-related fears with avoidance, hypervigilance, disuse, depression, disability, very similar to the sensitized pain uh, cycles I was showing earlier. Or um, alternatively, if you can get on the other track, uh, overcome the fear through confrontation and lead to recovery. So the idea here is, is that pain adaptation can result or not result depending on how you deal with fear as a secondary aspect or a, a part of the pain experience. Well, here's another model. Um, Robert or Bob Twillman, who is the executive director of the uh, Academy of Integrative Pain Management uh, wrote an article and uh, entitled Chronic Pain, Symptom or Disease, Why Does It Matter? And in this model, uh, which he, he simplified, he, he talks about a peripheral pain generator creating pain symptoms which signal through pain pathways and it is a normal adaptive function. The treatment is to dampen or block the pain signals and heal the pain generator and it is effectively treated with opioids or non-opioid medications and NSAIDs and so on. Well, um, that's a very simple model, I'll say that. Um, you know, it's really just basic a few blocks there uh, for acute pain. Sensitized pain, he describes as having minimal or no peripheral pain generator. In other words, it's now being taken over by the sensitization and the inflammation and the, the uh, runaway um, inflammatory response and the stress response. Um, it, it is a, uh, apart from the tissue damage here from the pain generator, um, he was calling it a disease because it is independent to some degree, at least of the initial injury. And it involves alterations of the nervous system, the central, the peripheral, and the autonomic. It is maladaptive. 
the treatment is to restore and rehabilitate the nervous system, in our case, particularly the autonomic. And typically, non-pharmacological treatments are effective. And uh, either pharmacological or non-pharmacological may also be used. And by this, I think, is probably referring to psychotropics um, uh, rather than the, uh, the opioids. So when we line these two up then, um, um, uh, if we go back now to this pain model here of Mosley, uh, this should be Mosley here, not Mormor. Um, uh, he says that uh, the sensible terms to use in describing a model are the nociceptor, the nociceptive pathway, spinal nociceptors, and nociceptive signals. Uh, these are all standard uh, anatomical terms. And he's adding on to that these friendly, but also accurate terms like the danger detector, the danger transmitter, the signal, and the messenger, uh, which uh, brings his model into this uh, subjective or psychological factors associated with pain. And I go so far as to say uh, nonsense terms include pain generator, receptor, pain pathway, pain fibers, pain meshes, which um, you know seems to be um, pretty um, close overlap of the other models. So you, you be the judge here. Point of this is that um, there are different models uh, that we can subscribe to in trying to um, understand pain. So now let's turn from the pain models to the autonomic self-regulation. Uh, this is from our work here from our proposal a couple of years ago. At that point, I was conceptualizing heart rate variability biofeedback not only as well, really a central. Um, uh, at this point in time, I, I would just gladly substitute autonomic self-regulation every time you see HRV biofeedback. Um, but the model is that chronic pain will cause central sensitization, loss of negative feedback regulation of stress response, leading to autonomic imbalance, allostatic stress, depressed mood. This is the disease pathway. So when we get the autonomic imbalance, we have associated with it the stress and depression due to the neuromodulator profile, which is so very similar to chronic stress. In this case, pain is the stress that is causing uh, the stress response and depression. Uh, reducing heart rate variability leading to dysregulation and uh, disease states here and increased morbidity and mortality. If we can add biofeedback, and restore the autonomic balance or uh, improve normal function is probably a better way to say that. If we can restore normal autonomic function where parasympathetic is now functioning to a greater degree and reduce the sympathetic overdrive that produces the health pathway. When autonomic balance is restored, stress is reduced, emotional regulation is recovered, and we go down the increased uh, the uh, health pathway uh, which can be um, indicated by uh, heart rate variability and, and coherence measures. Uh, we haven't explored this particular variable here, but the idea is, is that normal heart rate variability um, is, uh, will lead to, is associated with uh, good sleep patterns, normal activity, as well as mental alertness and increased well-being and longevity. And here's another version of the model. Uh, here we're sort of uh, part way, we're moving in the direction of autonomic self-regulation. There's resonance frequency breathing with mindfulness and positive emotional state. So if we start with a painful event and we have the autonomic dysregulation leading to heart rate acceleration, decreased HRV, these are all indicators of sympathetic overdrive uh, resulting from the chronic stress of pain. And the chronic pain then becomes centrally sensitized and we, um, we get the, uh, what uh, one guy called the inflammatory pain, which we're calling sensitized pain, which brings with it stress and depression. Now, if we are able to add our autonomic self-regulation at any of these stages here, we are able or we are trying to um, return, restore autonomic self-regulation, restore heart rate deceleration. This is uh, equivalent to uh, stimulating vagal tone, uh, increase uh, heart rate variability measures, and reduce pain by lowering the inflammatory component or the sensitized component. So this is a um, later model of management of centrally amplified pain using autonomic self-regulation. 
And uh, lastly, I think this is the last uh, model. Um, if we have neuropathic pain on the one hand, no susceptive pain, this is and or, uh, either or, um, it can um, devolve into chronic pain if it doesn't go away. It then becomes centrally sensitized. The central sensitization brings in the stress and depression components here, adding more to central sensitization, which feeds back then onto the nociceptive pain. Probably not so much onto neuropathic uh, nerve damage, but um, nonetheless, um, it is still adding to central sensitization, and we are experiencing chronic pain now, which is sensitized, bringing in the stress and depression. If, however, uh, we can add to it the um, autonomic self-regulation. What we believe happens here is that the chronic pain now does either does not become or it, the sensitization is reduced and therefore lowering the uh, feedback to the nociceptive pain, reducing the stress and depression, lowering to large degree the inflammatory component here. It doesn't heal tissue necessarily, but there are arguments that even neuropathic pain, when it has a large uh, component of inflammation and sensitization, can benefit from uh, the autonomic self-regulation. So um, this uh, one more graphic here, uh, what we're doing here is balancing ASR with coherence, heart rate variability coherence, and autonomic balance or normal function against the chronic stress, the pain sensitization, and the symptom cluster. So we're going to take off from this point here of symptom cluster uh, into research and what we're doing uh, by trying to collect data on this. And the first study, which was a very small pilot study of heart rate variability uh, on uh, chronic pain in veterans, and a second study using biofeedback for symptom management among cancer survivors, and third, biofeedback in pain patients, pilot intervention for pain, fatigue, and sleep, which is currently ongoing here at the VA uh, as a merit review project. So in the first study, which was quite small, uh, my friend and colleague, Melanie Berry, uh, who is a uh, biofeedback coach extraordinaire, um, brought about this study in our pain clinic and uh, the um, Pre-treatment values here, there were, I believe, nine. I'd have to dig it out there, and I apologize that the uh, um, graphic is, is kind of fuzzy. There were, I believe, uh, either nine or eight in each group. Uh, one was a wait list control, which was brought back for post-testing four to six weeks after uh, bio, active biofeedback treatment. Well, there we go. Um, there were six, uh, six and eight uh, in the two groups, and uh, the mean ages were comparable. The pre-treatment values for the control and the treatment groups were not statistically different. That's just a result of the um, randomization. Uh, we only used two uh, very simple um, uh, instruments. Uh, one was the brief pain inventory, and one was the perceived stress index. There are subscales from these, and so it actually generated a number of other uh, variables, four or five altogether, and then we have them pre and post. So when we look at our, our first uh, change, our first results here, you can see the pattern where several of these variables do change from pre to post uh, significantly in the treatment group. So we produce coherence, reduced perception of pain, and um, we can look at that a little better here. Changes in coherence and associated uh, effect on measures of pain, physical activity, negative emotion, and perceived stress. Uh, in this uh, graphic here, coherence changes uh, from pre to post, whereas there's little or no change uh, from pre to post in the waitlist group. Uh, perception of pain decreased. Um, the um, physical activity limitation decreased, but not in the controls. Uh, negative affect uh, was, negative emotion was reduced, and perceived stress was reduced. Effects were analyzed with ANCOVA, which is relatively conservative, of post scores by group 
using the pre-scores as covariates. So for such a small group, it was a pretty striking effect on a very limited set of variables. Post-HRVB training, the treatment group was significantly lower than the control group on all outcome measures. So here we're not looking at the interaction, we're just looking at post and, and comparing uh, their status post, uh, realizing that they were randomized and there were no baseline differences. So it was a very um, interesting, very uh, good results, strong results. So uh, it led to two other studies, uh, this one among cancer survivors who were in the um, CEOS, it's called, uh, the Cancer Institute, the Center for Integrative Oncology and Survivorship in Greenville. And our friends there, Mark O'Rourke, who is the director, is very interested in heart rate variability biofeedback and has brought it into his cancer integrative uh, oncology and survivorship program. So we had um, a number of people working on this project from USC, my friend and colleague James Birch, uh, and a um, number of people up in, in Greenville running this. So the background was that cancer survivors uh, appear to have lower HRV coherence than normal controls. Coherence is probably stretching a little bit. They do have lower HRV according to several studies. Um, and HRV biofeedback training improves coherence and restores autonomic health. That's our assumptions here, our, in our background. The question, will biofeedback reduce late effects of cancer in its treatment, including stress, pain, depression, fatigue, and insomnia? This is the um, symptom Comp the um, symptom cluster that I believe can be defined and um, uh, delineated uh, in survivors or in individuals with chronic pain conditions and chronic disease of all sorts. And this is what is the outcome, the behavioral outcome of um, the inflammation and sensitization. So this was a randomized weightless controlled clinical trial Participants in the intervention arm received weekly HRVB training up to six weeks. A waitlist control group was matched. Outcome measures were assessed at baseline and at post. So the schema here, um, people were randomized into either the active intervention or the control. Uh, both, everyone was assessed at baseline. Six weeks later, there was a follow-up, a post baseline uh, or a, a post assessment. Uh, these, this group here had the uh, biofeedback training and uh, we then compare, we could compare pre to post as well as post. Uh, sleep activity was also control, uh, collected and the uh, variables uh, that were run here uh, that reflect the symptom cluster, stress was measured with perceived stress scale, depression with Beck depression inventory, fatigue with the multi-dimensional fatigue inventory, pain with the brief pain inventory, and sleep with the insomnia symptom questionnaire. We also have the actigraphy data, but uh, these are only going to be, what I'm only have here right now tonight is the, uh, the self-reports um, questionnaires here. We also measured PTSD and chronotype, but uh, it's not presented here right now. So after fairly careful screening, because in a cancer center, uh, there's no shortage of individuals who want to participate in research, and 38 were enrolled and several dropped out, leaving us with a total of 34. And through randomization, each group wound up with 17. Uh, there were no differences baseline, so the randomization looked like it was, it was pretty good. And the first result to come out of this then was that there, there's good evidence here pre-training for the symptom cluster, the intercorrelations of the measures of depression, fatigue, pain, interference, and sleep all intercorrelated and some at a very high degree. So this is, I believe, good evidence that there is this symptom cluster that reflects sensitization and the, the whole um, uh, stress uh, and uh, autonomic or the uh, sympathetic overdrive seems to be the common factor in these uh, aspects. I think of it as a crystal, different aspects of a single crystal uh, as the symptom cluster. And if we look then at individual score, at um, individual indicators of uh, these, including um, heart rate variability, just using SDNN, and we could do a number of different comparisons here. We can do pre uh, and no differences here. This is our randomization. If we do post, uh, HRVB versus control. This is just looking at the scores of the groups 
post um, and you sort of make the assumption that the baseline here is the same and there were differences across the board pre to post all of these in the, the expected direction and then if we look at the interaction using a mixed model uh, to account for some of the missing data and look at HRVB by control pre to post again we get interactions uh, the pain interference didn't quite make it uh, but uh, overall there's pretty good evidence here in a slightly larger group that all of these elements of the symptom cluster um, do respond to the biofeedback treatment. All right, and the last study then that we're doing now today is a four-year VA merit funded study. Uh, we're intending to enroll 80 with 40 in each of two groups uh, with and without HRV biofeedback. In this case, um, uh, let's see, uh, just very briefly here, the uh, hypothesis, very similar, coherence reduces sensitization, biofeedback produces coherence, biofeedback will reduce centrally sensitized pain, stress, and depression. They will reduce sensitized pain and stress and depression because the same neural structures. This is a lot of what was in part one. And um, whether or not neuropathic pain responds is, is still sort of uh, out there. Um, and it, it's hard to get at that. But the, the schema for this, very similar, except here we have a sham treatment where we bring them into the lab and we do a little bit of coaching and sort of just passive, try to relax, just uh, take it easy, but no training in breathing and no uh, positive emotion uh, induction and no mindfulness. Um, and uh, then we do pre-post assessments. We also have a persistence here uh, eight weeks later. Actually, there are four time points. We have pre, post, a booster session after um, eight weeks, and then yet another follow-up uh, eight weeks after that. So it's, it's fairly lengthy from pre to post. And we did offer uh, more or less on ethical grounds and uh, for other reasons as well. We offered those who were in the sham group um, some of the biofeedback intervention if they wanted it. So we can look at um, pre to post, we can look at uh, persistence of any changes in our outcome variables across a fairly long period of time. Well, what's interesting and important about this is, although these are the same variables we saw in the cancer survivors, we added uh, significantly the pain catastrophizing scale. And the pain catastrophizing scale is, is really crucial. It's central for anyone who deals with pain regularly. And it is such an important uh, way to con to try to um, measure or to uh, get an indicator of the level of pain experience. Um, very, very important. And it's not news. Uh, people who are in pain clinics uh, everywhere know that catastrophizing, which is a part of that fear avoidance um, response. So here's a, just a brief overlook of the pain catastrophizing scale. I don't have to go into it in any great detail, but just so you can see what it is. Well, what happened here, uh, these are all pre-training. And uh, again, the symptom cluster hangs together nicely. And catastrophizing, very, very strong predictor. In fact, catastrophizing is the strongest predictor of pain experience of all the other variables. If you're only going to measure one variable in your pain population, I recommend catastrophizing it will predict very strongly. You can look across here. It's got such great uh, predictability. If we go catastrophize, catastrophize, it's, it is um, a part of, it shares variance with all of the other symptom clusters. All right, uh, we haven't analyzed this um, for um, groups yet. Uh, it's, it's blinded, but we can still, you know, we, we are able to look at it by groups. We're in the process of looking at our groups now, so I cannot show you any of the group data. So I'm going to stop here. We do have a little bit of time for questions, and um, I thank you all for... Hello. Yep, you're back. Yes. I'm trying to unmute everybody. Sorry about that, Jack. Okay. I just wanted to, uh, I'm, I'm slowly unmuting people or attempting to, and uh, it takes time. But I thought that fact about catastrophizing was 
fascinating. Yes, yes. Uh, that was not something that I expected to see. The fact that catastrophizing can seems to be really important when it comes to amplifying pain. I think I felt that I knew that about sleep, but it was very interesting that that would be a major factor. Was that what what led you to to, to that conclusion? Was that in previous research or? That's a wonderful question. When we when we submitted the proposal for the VA grant, which is fairly large scale, four years, and it got a significant budget, uh, we um, acquired a pain a consultant, and uh, that's my friend and colleague Ron Garbo, who has been with the um, Riverside um, Clinic in uh, I think it's Newport News, Virginia, and it was Ron who is a physiatrist. He's a pain doctor. And Ron is very knowledgeable, wonderful insights about heart rate variability. He uses it in his clinic. It was Ron who said, you've got to have catastrophizing. You can't do this without catastrophizing. So we looked into it. We all liked it. And it was because of his expert consultations that we came to realize that catastrophizing is such a significant predictor. And Richard, you can see how easily you can see how it fits in conceptually into all of those models, like the, the um, Mosley model of a perception of danger. If, you're, if your danger receptor is always on, if you're always getting a blast of alarm, of danger or i.e. catastrophizing and fear avoidance, you're going to maintain that central amplification. So it's a way of encapsulating all of the other symptoms into a subjective type of measure of what is your fear and what are the effects of having fear of uh, continued environmental stress and danger. Well, what's fascinating about that, Jack, too, is that um, catastrophization is one of the, the key dimensions in um, the uh, automatic thinking, automatic feeling model of Aaron Beck when it comes to depression. And then you have depression so closely right, right. related with this as well. So um, uh, that right. certainly brings in the psychological right. component. Um, right, right. Right, but although we're talking about a pain population here now, not specifically a depression population, but you can see that's where the overlaps are. That that is that's why it's such a significant. It's like the core of the, the crystal of the symptom cluster uh, is that catastrophizing. Yeah. Yes. This this is Rick. Can I interject? Yeah, yeah please, Rick. Speak up. So, so it's fascinating uh, topic and fascinating, great uh, presentation. And so I will point out something that we pointed out several times in the seminar series that animal studies have shown uh, that um, uh, overdrive of the sympathetic system uh, opens up the blood brain barrier and a EEG signature, an EEG signature for that is actually slowing of the brain waves. Really? So slowing. Slowing of that opens the blood brain barrier. Now you're talking about veterans, so you're talking about soldiers and people who've been exposed to a lot of chemicals. So now we're opening the blood brain barrier to that. What role does that play in pain sensitization? Well, you also mentioned acetate and the Western diet. And the acetate is known to inhibit insulin release, of course. Uh, and the interesting thing about acetate it is it also activates glial cells, especially microglia and astrocytes. Oh. Now we got, you know, activation of glia, which is involved in pro-inflammatory responses, we know. And we have to consider what role that plays in sensitization right. of the right. pain response, right, which right. is which has, in animal studies is shown to be considerable. Right, right. Well, it, it's a complex model. It would have a lot of different moving parts. Yes. Um, and what you're saying, you know, is, is really just confirmatory. Uh, let me ask you this. When you say slowing the brain, what sort of frequencies are we talking about? From what to what do you get? Well, it? Is it only in animal studies or is there any way that we can correlate this with what we think of as, you know, human type of EEG signals? Yes, of course. Well, the point is we can't really study blood-brain barrier opening up in humans very well, although probably now this, there are some advanced uh, neuroimaging techniques that might be able to do that. Um, 
that I'm not aware of, but uh, you should probably look into that or some neuroimaging techniques can be developed to look at how the blood brain barrier is opened up in humans. But in animals, in animals, it's very easy to study and it's really been shown and so when we talk about slowing the brain waves in animals it corresponds to a shift to more theta and delta activity in humans wow rick can you write that up for us in a paper <laughs> i'd like I to can. publish it <laughs> i'd like yeah, to publish that in the new mind okay, journal okay you got it you got it really We're gonna do a review you're going to do a review article yeah it'd be fantastic Okay, I'll write it up, and you can even be the first author. How's that? That's uh, that. <laughs> oh. Okay, you're on. <laughs> All right, no, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. I, I, I'm going to start working you're, on something like that. Do it. Rick, you're very excited. That's that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm with thing. you, Rick. That's, that's okay. you connected some right. really good dots there that directly right, relate right, to right, us. right, right, right. There's a big take-home message here, which is is that all you know with our scientific methodology now we can produce all of these new factors and quantify them, whether it's translational or whether it's through study, human studies, which of course are harder to do. But the finding of the immune response, um, which is um, you know the the gatekeepers uh, in the meninges that are allowing T cells to move in and out, that's a very important factor. And I can't help but think that somehow that's related to what. Rick is talking about mm -hmm. uh, when he talks about changes in blood brain barriers, although I can't quite see the connection yet. Yeah, well, we don't know very much about about what you're talking about and that that, that the meninges, you're talking about the, the dural sinuses, having lymphatics in them, that's really right. exciting. Right. Because we right. always thought that the brain didn't have lymphatics. Right, right. This is it's. A, I mean, the references are there, and uh, you know, I picked this up maybe six or eight months ago. I know it has a place in there somewhere. Yeah. And, you know, because you know, doggone well, it, we've all got to eat. Cells. Somehow it's related to the. It's somehow it can be related to diet. I, I just think that's that's oh, what yeah. makes the most sense to me. Well, activated T cells. Come on, those are pro-inflammatory. They release pro-inflammatory cytokines. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that they that they sensitize. We already know that there's a uh, compound called CGRP, calcitonin gene related peptide, that sensitizes the trigeminal nucleus during migraine attack, attacks. That's why migraine attacks keep happening. Oh, so, that's new. That's yeah, yeah I get up. it. And, and that's why that, you know, uh, migraines are uh, do have a, a diet component for many people. I mean, things like chocolate. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so on. Although all of this is so multifactorial, but if right. we want to think in terms of our patients and emphasizing something that is within there, that's integrative. And this is the lesson that, that Mark O'Rourke likes to make is, is that, look, there are some things that you can do to control your body and some things you can control to your bodily responses. And diet is probably the first thing to get your hand around. Oh, sure. We are what we eat. Come on. Uh -huh. It should be on everybody's refrigerator. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, Did anybody else have any uh, input? Yeah, Jack, this was fascinating. Thanks for uh, doing this. And uh, Richard, I think it's so important to understand the connection between the catastrophizing and the lack of inhibition so that we can make a connection between the psychologizing aspects of our social definition of self and this biological definition of self. I was, I was hoping James Hobson would be able to throw in the, um, <laughs> the importance of the minerals in the cell walls and, and try and make some connection between the power of positive thinking and the strength of the cell walls to increase one's resilience so that Yes, one can have freedom of thought and freedom of association, but at the same time, if you're watching your diet and you're doing all the other healthy lifestyle things, um, we get down to a certain certain commonalities where where language is so restrictive. It's very. We all, I always get back to this point that we often talking about similar things and we're using different language to get to the uh, some of the basic things. 
Well, I think your underlying point, correct me if I'm wrong, but are, are you saying yeah. that an extended vocabulary or, or a well-developed uh, linguist, verbal uh, uh, conceptual apparatus is, is a form of resilience? Is that it? Uh, yes, it's a, it's a form of resilience, but <clears throat> um, there's also a danger that we use in trying to be interdisciplinary. There's a point at which we, we, um, I, look, I admire you researchers for trying to encapsulate, to get the data, but I, I always just feel overwhelmed by the limitations of language in trying to capture the data we're looking for. Oh, okay. So it's not so much limitations as it is the, the multi the manifold uh, ramifications of language, I think. I mean, you're saying it sort of is, it prevents right. us from really truly understanding what, what pain is or what our experience is? That's right. I mean, I think Aaron Beck used the word catastrophizing for certain phenomena that were there before, and he found a more simple way <laughs> of talking about automatic thoughts, which <clears throat> since he was trained in psychodynamic psychotherapy, they were talking about a similar thing with a different vocabulary. And every time you find a giant genius, they use their own language to describe the same underlying phenomena. Oh, okay. Well, you, you, you do sound like a philosopher, <laughs> and, and that's not a bad thing. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are we to do then? <laughs> well, keep doing what you're doing, Jack. You've got a great contribution. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other comments before we wrap this up for the evening? We're about we're a little over time, but we've got some very good uh, discussion going, and I don't want to shut it down too fast until everybody's had their their input. Okay, Jack, sounds sounds quiet out there at the moment. I think everybody's really uh, cogitating pretty heavily trying to uh, sort all this out that you've presented. It was, a, again, a wonderful presentation. I know I'm going to watch it a couple more times on the uh, uh, New Mind Maps YouTube channel and uh, uh, th uh, think about it a lot more. It's great stuff, um, and we look forward to hearing about, you know, your outcome of this uh, research that you're doing now. So uh, that'll be exciting as well. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, we'll look forward to your next presentation down the road. Thank you, Richard. Well, have a great week, everybody. We'll be getting together on Wednesday. And uh, again, if you have a map you want to review or uh, topics you want to discuss, uh, feel free to uh, email me uh, and Rob, and we'll uh, be happy to bring them up and review them in detail. And maybe we can talk a little bit more about what Jack presented uh, tonight here, too, on Wednesday. So uh, until then, uh, have a good week. Good night.